we're all ready to go, ladies. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, it's Giselle for Pills of Grace Ministries, Sidoni and Goom, and we are back again. It's the last Thursday of the month of August, and so we are looking at our Women of the Bible series. Um, so we've been doing this. I think this is our third week. You can catch up on the previous two women that we've done so far um, on the podcast, either on um, the group, the Facebook group, or you can find us on Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, anywhere you listen to, really. We're also on Audible. Um, but yeah, so we have done um, Abigail, AXA, and this week brings us to Ada and Zilla. Um, and these are the two wives of Lamech, and we find them in Genesis chapter 4, verses 19 to 24. Gum, have you got a Bible to hand? Do you want to read? Um, I'll have to have download, have an online Bible. What would you like me to read? So just that passage that makes reference to those women. So Genesis 4, 19 to 24. Okay, do you have... Sorry, say that um, Genesis four. Okay, nineteen to twenty-four. Okay, do you have a version that you prefer? Um, I think NIV is fine or NLT, whichever one. Okay, to like NIV. So let's go for Genesis four nineteen to twenty-four. Okay. NIV. Okay, guys, just give me some time. Okay, so. This is about Lamech and his wife. So, can you hear me? Yes, but we can hear feedback too. Okay. okay, it's gone. That was my fault. Oh, right. Okay. No, that's fine. Okay, so it says here um, Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zilla. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who played string instruments and pipes. Okay, sorry, guys, my screen has just gone off. I'm not sure why. Um, okay, so sorry. So I'll just read it again. Um, I'll start at 21. So we've talked about the brother Jabal, and then he has a brother called Jubal. He was the father of all who played string instruments and pipes. Zilla also had a son, Jubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Jubal Cain's sister was Nama, or Nima, however you pronounce that. Lamech had said to his two wives, Ada and Zilla, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech, 77 times so that's oh wow okay um Giselle just coming over to you um this is Lamech who if we look at sorry if we look at the family tree he is um Cain's grandson or great-grandson might be a great-grandson be a great-grandson isn't he would be seventh yes. generation here yeah. Yes, okay, so he's a great, great even. Um, and and it's interesting because, I mean, this is looking at verse 24, he's obviously killed a man, like his yeah. great-grandfather did. Um, but what's interesting with Lamech here, um, I find, is that he, he doesn't live by God's rules because, nope. you know, in, in our book that we're using, um, so... Just for anybody that doesn't know, and you probably haven't been following the series from the start, we are using the book called Women of the Bible, The Life and Times of Every Woman in the Bible. Um, and we will put up a picture uh, in the group if you want to know which one it is. Um, but if not, feel free to drop us an email or a message and we can send you a picture. Um, but in, in just going back to this, in this um, book that we're reading, it tells us here that Lamech is the first person in the Bible mm -hmm. to be polygamous. Yeah, first recorded. <laughs> so we actually have somebody 
recorded who is deviating because you know even Adam and Eve they are it's a monogamous marriage but this is the first person in the bible that is recorded as being polygamous so he's deviating from God's rules you know just to start with what does this make you think of? I mean, apart from the fact that he's following in Adam's and, and, and Cain's footsteps, um, when you see that, does that straight away go to you alarm bells? Uh-oh. Big time. Big time. <laughs> because although they're in the Bible, to me, they're not following God. Because mm-hmm. you, know, we've got, like, what, six verses with them? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And very briefly, you know, it doesn't say whether there's any worship to God, whether there's any sacrifices mm. to God. There's, there's, mm. there's, there's nothing, mm. and you, know, there's no spiritual legacy left by the woman. Mm. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, there's nothing. So, they mm. are say it. Might they have been pagan? <laughs> That's a possibility. Yeah. It, it's possible. It is possible. Um. Because, I mean, even when we, you know, the Bible's clear, it's one man, one woman, um, you know, and the book we're reading makes reference back to Genesis 2.24, where it says, you know, they shall become one flesh. Now, in, in, in those days, can we suppose or, or assume that perhaps the reason why a man would have married two wives, or maybe why a woman would have wanted to be a second wife, could it have maybe been... Um, you know, financial reasons or cultural pressures? What do you suppose that would have tempted? Unless maybe like you say, I'll just think this is me thinking out loud now. Maybe they were pagan. Maybe this was acceptable. Yep. To it, them. Because you know, yeah. it, it, it certainly wasn't God's laws. Mm. Um, there's, there's something really weird about it. There, there, there really is. I just don't think that they've sort of decided you to up and be the first man recorded uh, to be a polygamist. But mm. um, it does make you think too that sort of you that yeah, there was even all that nonsense going on in those days. We mm. see lots of people seem to think today that uh, homosexuality and lesbianism and all the rest of it is all a twenty uh, first century. What? phenomena it's mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. yeah you know, mm-hmm. I, I often say to people you where do you think the name uh sodomy came from mm-hmm. it comes from sodom and gomorrah mm-hmm. it happened in biblical times and um so you're not inventing a new thing you're just no, renaming no, an old no, thing no, <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's, it's like tr- trying to reinvent the wheel mm-hmm. it, it been and done it and and mm-hmm. everything um yeah you what would make a woman really okay well, i was going to say what would make a woman really uh want to be uh to be the second wife now it does say in our book that uh ada's name means adorned and zillab's mm-hmm. main name means shadow or protection mm-hmm. now when you google the, the two names you get a bit more uh for ada and mm-hmm. it means ornament, adornment, beauty, and pleasure. Well, wow. okay. okay. So, was Ada maybe a trophy wife? Possibly. Mm. And she could have been just, you know, the, like the modern or day. Or was she maybe wife. the first wife? Well, maybe the first wife, yeah, but but uh, uh, maybe a trophy wife. And then Zilla meaning shadow. Has she lived all her days then? In Lamax mm. and Ada's glory, she she lived in their shadows. Could be. That's interesting, isn't it? But interesting, That's... both women bore children. So if yes. one of so if one of them was a trophy wife, if one was the one to bear children and the other one was to be a trophy wife, both end up uh, bearing children. Yes, because isn't this isn't this just a little bit reminiscent? I mean, you know, just to draw a loose, very loose parallel with Jacob, you know, and and yeah. his wife. But in that instance, you know, the first wife didn't bear children initially, anyway. But here, they've both born children. So, what really has pushed this man to marry a second wife? Unless maybe 
for lustful reasons, perhaps, is, is Ava's name. I mean, we're not told which wife is the first and, and which one is the second. No, we're uh, not. We're not. But what would have pushed the man whose first wife had born children, maybe lust, to, to have a second wife? Um, but, you know, what's also interesting here is they don't make any reference to any sort of, you know, for example, in you know throughout the bible and if even if we look at jacob for example we have this issue of um an unsettled polygamous family home mm -hmm. you know we have this issue of infighting and we even see it with you know um jacob and esau you know the mother's trying to better jacob because he's old and and you know they're trying to plot Rachel's trying to plot behind you know jacob's back when esau goes off but we don't, we don't see any of that here um but for, for for i mean you know i'm just coming over to you because i know that you i mean feel free to not talk about this if you don't want to but i know from experience that you know you have experienced something of coming from that background um and just from your experience and from people that you've spoken to or dealt with what are sometimes the struggles that play out in the Bible in other stories, maybe not so much in this story as we see. But what are some of the struggles that not adhering to God's law of monogamy can cause within families? I mean, we see it in Jacob and Esau, this fighting of birthrights. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think the issues are not necessarily different from monogamous families. So, for example, Jacob and Esau were even twins, right? Mm -hmm, Same mm -hmm. mother. But I think the difference with polygamous families is that you just now have a situation where these risks that are in there can be amplified. So mm. there are very few of us who come from African backgrounds mm. who do have this, right? Mm. I've been a grandparent or great-grandparent because, mm -hmm. you know, Christianity and so on, you know, people were doing other things. They were worshipping other gods. They were they were living. I mean, you even have who are Christians who still found their way sells into one. So, <laughs> you know, but you know, it's it, it's something that you know polygamy has a very old history, mm -hmm. and if you look at it, a lot of it was you know, some of it came down to plain lust. Let's not lie. A lot mm -hmm, of these mm -hmm, were lustful, mm -hmm. but there was also another reason for, for example, from our background, you had the economic reasons, right? You had this. Mm -hmm agrarian families you know the larger your family the better you know for you to make money and so one wife wasn't going to give you all the many children that you see as, as a source of labor very pragmatic i mean my mother's father had i don't even know how many wives if i'm honest mm -hmm. and what i hear about him was a very astute businessman mm -hmm. so i think for him there was an element of you know this is a business decision mm -hmm. but women you know the work mm -hmm. on who do all this trade and so human beings being human beings will always try to create um ways to mitigate these things so for example mm -hmm. again in many african cultures they realize that this thing is potentially problematic they did and so you had things like okay the first wife the husband doesn't go and marry otherwise without the first wife's consent right mm -hmm. and things like that to try and bring peace but this is man trying to find solutions and we know that man's solutions are never enough so no matter how much tradition and everything was supposed to keep the peace, mm. I think many people learn to live with it. And mm -hmm. maybe some people just, you know, had that personality to just flow. But mm -hmm. in general, mm. I find that the peace in a lot of polygamous families are usually a very uneasy peace. Mm -hmm. One of those things where sometimes people just have to sacrifice and say, okay, my hand's in the air. I'm just going to let go of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's a compromise to have this peace because it's, you know, it's something that is not in God's will. It's never going to be perfect. But you know what is so amazing about God mm. is that even in those circumstances, God will still step in. He shows himself, doesn't he? And 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 that just brings me to the, the, the thing that I actually found quite striking in, in this short passage that we've read is the fact that even though Lamech deviates from God's plan, God uses his deviation and his disobedience to forge and foster what we know today as advanced civilization oh yeah i mean and that in this that just struck me because i was like hang on a minute these people have obviously done something wrong they've obviously 
this guy has obviously gone off and married two wives, even though God has said, you know, initially God only made one man, one woman in the Garden of Eden, and they would have known that. But God, in his infinite mercy, looked at this situation and went, well, okay, you've only gone and done what you've done, right? And it's wrong. And God's going, well, what good? What, how can I bless you through your wrongdoing? And how many times have we experienced that? I mean, Giselle, how many times have you, like, your mistake has led to a blessing? <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to put it uh, quite, just quite bluntly, how many times have you done something really bad and you've deviated from God's word and God's plan and you've disobeyed, knowingly or knowingly? But God has turned that into a source of blessing. Never. <laughs> Never. The only, thing, the, the only thing I've gotten from my mistakes is I've learned my lesson. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a blessing, G. That's a blessing. Oh, yeah. You can see the people. Yep. That, that's true. Now, um, pre-born again days, when I mm -hmm. think back, to uh, what my life was then when I look back on it God really did have his hand in me then and mm -hmm. uh, yeah there was lots of mistakes I made that he protected me from mm -hmm. and yes he did turn them into mm -hmm. blessings for me but I didn't realise mm -hmm. it at the time it's only older and wiser only later, yeah, only that, later. That, I can, that I can think but back maybe they that. didn't either you know, the, these two women didn't know that the sons that they had born, who, you know, one, um, Jabba was the father of those who, you know, agrarian lifestyle. So those who dwell in tents and livestock. Then we have Juba, who's the father of musicians and, and, you know, music. And we know that the Psalms play a huge part in praise and worship. Down with Juba. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we know that later on, you know, the Psalms through David and, and music and the harp and the lyre and the flute, they play a huge part in praise and worship to God. Um, and then Zilla becomes an instructor of craftsmen and bronze and iron. And yeah. we know that when God gives the instructions to build the ark, which Solomon then finally builds, these skills are all what comes into play. Yeah. And we know that God is making provision for his people later as mm. to the, the skills and the crafts set that they would need to to praise him and live in worship with him so you know like you say we might not know it at the time but you say that you know you're you're making a mistake and you really don't know but god really does use some of those sometimes he does but the thing about that is it was their children that did these not Lamak and the wives. Yes. Yes. So the children were sinless. Well, okay, we're all born into sin, but the children mm. in those situations were sinless. Mm. So mm. it was those that God took apart, is what I see from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So not so much the people that made the mistakes, but their children. Yep. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. But could they then, could it be argued that they, perhaps benefited from that because they are named here um as the mothers they could have just been nameless oh yeah they yeah they could have been um but there is do you do you maybe think that there is an aspect of mercy shown to them in the fact that they are named in the bible that's a very interesting point and yeah when you bring it up, yeah, possibly. In fact, more than likely, yeah. Because they could have just been, you know, in in we we see the the um, we see yeah. the descendant and the family line from Cain, and obviously yeah. all the men are mentioned, aren't they? Mm -hmm. The women aren't until we get to Lamech's two wives, and actually the the, the subtitle, the subheading in the Bible really names it Lamech's two wives. <laughs> and, you, and you see, with very little written about them, now it mm. goes on in Genesis uh, and Lamech is mentioned again you, mm. further on in Genesis 
mm. but the two wives aren't. So it was very, right. very, very little history about them. Yeah, but it gives us their name. Yes. But interesting. I watched something, I can't remember where, and somebody said something which I thought was very striking. You know, a lot of the time people complain, and I have complained about the lack of, you know, mention of women or depth mm. of them in the Bible. And somebody said, you know, silence is also a literary instrument. And I think the Holy Spirit did that very deliberately mm. to just show us how we human beings can be and just mm. what the place of women has been historically. Mm. Because like you said, Sidoni, for the, you know, these women's sons grew up to accomplish so much, but did society even really notice them? Mm. What if that was the Holy Spirit's commentary? Like, you know, I'm going to be silent here because I want you humans to see how much you don't see because this is a consistent theme in the mm. Bible. But it's also just occurred to me that perhaps these women were not as, I mean, the commentary in the book is very interesting to me because mm. the author comes up with this proposition that these women may have led very empty lives. Mm. Possibly not true as well. Because mm. if you look at what their sons went on to achieve, these yeah. were big things. So where could they have learned some of those things from, right? Who could have mm. influenced them to go out there and do these things? Mm. So there is just so much room. I think for me, the, the more interesting thing is why did they decide to marry a guy who just seems clearly reckless and unapologetic? I mean, he kills somebody, then he gathers his family and he's, he's like, there's no hint of <laughs> repentance. <laughs> The audacity <laughs> of him. I tell you. <laughs> Typical man. Kill me. Like this guy is something else. So yeah. my thing, what are you people even doing with this man? <laughs> you know. But maybe, maybe it was an aspect of, you know, I mean, um, Zilla's name gives us maybe there's an aspect of the second wife, if in if indeed she was, maybe there's an aspect of protection. Maybe he was a wealthy man. Um, you know, the commentary in the book says, you know, what are you giving up? You know, when you break God's rules, almost kind of like, what what are you giving up? What are you willing to surrender? Your self-respect or, um, you know, perhaps he was a landowner. Perhaps he was a wealthy man. I mean, he must have been for his sons to have accomplished the thing these that things. Is. You know, he must have been a man of means. So I suppose for me like the author in the book says what are you willing to surrender um mm. to get what you want are you willing to give up god because they would have known god you know he, he, coming from the line of cain coming from the line of adam directly they would have known of the creator of heaven and earth lamech yeah. certainly would have so he it would have been a mm? maybe he wasn't their god because didn't cain go off somewhere else land of Nod or something and marry from but there he, but he knew of him oh no he knew that's what i'm saying that they would probably have known of him but oh yeah their god and lamech doesn't look to me like somebody who was really you know struggling to keep <laughs> he sounds more like cain than abel <laughs> he was just this kind of reckless lustful guy who met these women and then regardless of who they were worshiping and so if their society had already normalized this type of things Maybe to them it was just, you know, there are so many parts of the world where they just don't get it. Like when somebody, there are women who, okay, let's take, for example, in very, very typical Muslim cultures, the first wife already expects other women to come behind her. So she's mm. not even pressing. So maybe mm. they were from that kind of place where it was normal. So for them. Oh, yeah, it, it was, was normal. normal. It might have been to the women, but Lamech knew better. Because oh, no. Lamech was descendant from the line. That that really knew of Yahweh because his father was not exactly with God. I mean, it will be interesting to know because even okay, let's look at God, Cain's conversation with God. Right mm -hmm. when Cain killed Abel, was there any point when God was like, "Okay, Cain, you've done this, you've done this"? We didn't even hear Cain say, "Okay, I'm sorry." Cain's almost like, "Oh, your punishment is too great. Somebody will kill me." So there is this streak of narcissism that we see. In Cain mm. from the very beginning so mm. you could almost extrapolate and say that you know what he just had this entitlement that God would protect him went off and did whatever but whatever the case you see aspects of Cain's character in Lamech you know oh that yeah he's even a bit more brutal because he says he kills that man for what for wounding him yeah yes, probably, I mean he probably doesn't really 
it was probably about an overreaction g <laughs> <laughs> when you know what women love, but we yeah. see this in London today, right? Little boys mm. today will have somebody just for looking mm. at them. So, yeah. Mm, mm. and it's interesting because he says that you know the reference of 77 times 7 comes back in Matthew that's the gospel when, yeah. when Jesus yeah. is asked how many times yeah how many times should I forgive my brother but um, I mean for me Lamek is interesting because I personally think that he, he would have known better oh, I think I agree with you that there's a, there's a and, and it is inherent to all of us fallen humans there's a certain predisposition to want to do what we want mm. even even if we know that we shouldn't and sometimes we don't know sometimes we do know sometimes we do it just because our our will in, at that place and time supersedes God's will and so mm. we put our what we want over and above what God says we should want um, and for me when I look at this I see Lamech doing his will um, and marrying those two women I don't so much know that I can judge them because like Giselle said earlier we, we're not told a lot about the women no. so when we're not to know whether they went into it for financial reasons or for protection or like we've touched on it might just have been their cultural thing they, they might have been pagans and say so to them it was perfectly acceptable to which case was Lamech then playing on their ignorance and just marrying them, even though he knew what, you know, his God or the God of his fathers um, allowed or disallowed. Um, but I think most, most important, there are two points here, for, for me anyway, is that what are we willing to surrender? I mean, the author puts it here. He says, you know, um, what are you willing to surrender um, or trade, um, you know, for God's will? And say, so, you know, are we willing to our self-respect or comfort? Let's assume that they may be married for comfort or protection um, mm -hmm. as a second wife or as you know, in, into a polygamous marriage. I think we, well, certainly I'm asking myself, you know, if, if there were a young woman listening to this, what, what is your priority? What are you prioritizing? Are you prioritizing God's will and God's word and God's way of marriage, which is monogamy, mm -hmm. over and above money or status or comfort or protection or all the other things that the world promises to give you, even if that is in a polygamous home. But it could very well be in a mon monogamous home. Yes. Um, you know, so it's it's a case of if, if there's any single ladies listening to this, um, and perhaps they should just be thinking, what am I willing to prioritize when it comes to choosing a man? Am I going to follow God's will and, 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 and do God's will? Or am I going to do my will, which is tall, dark, handsome, millionaire, you know, private jet here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Breakfast in Milan, lunch in London, yeah, dinner in right. New York. <laughs> yes. Dream on, come on. <laughs> I've just thought about it, right? Because there are people who say that Sometimes in certain societies, polygamy is just a very pragmatic way of doing things. So mm -hmm. if you have a situation where there are too many women for men and mm -hmm. men are not going to be join the Catholic Church and become nuns, <laughs> what do people do? Because God did not make the men the, salv the salvation, salvation plan of women, okay? God did not send those men. <laughs> They're not doing the women any favors. <laughs> I want to be married. I don't want to be single. I don't want to be a nun. So what do I do? But that's it. You're putting your will over and above God's plan. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be. Is is the, the the I there starts? It starts the sentence. It's not God doesn't want me to be. It's no, I do don't want to. No, it's true, and that that's true. So, but then how does somebody? Because these things are very strong desires, right? And Sometimes it's difficult for somebody who really desires this thing to not have it. And that's just the reality. So oh, how yeah. would you advise somebody, you know, I've been a good girl all my life. I thought I would get married and then things are not really happening. I'm getting to this stage, I would have loved to have kids and everything. So somebody can feel like, look, I've trusted God all my life. Why is this not happening? And then some man comes who seems like a good guy. He's a nice person. He's a provider. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to mess around. He's like, I don't want to 
be this adulterous thing. I just want to honor you and bring you in as you know, my second, I've seen that where this wife has a place, this wife has a place and they're kind of doing their thing, right? And so he's like, I want this to be respectable. Let's be, you know, husband and wife will have kids, blah, 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 right? So you as this young woman in this situation, you're looking and you're thinking, okay, this but is- are you, are you even a wife? You know, according to the Christian religion, Giselle, you're the pastor, right? If you were marrying a, a second wife, I, is that person even a wife? For as long as the first wife is still alive, then the second wife is surely an adulteress. Yeah, that's it exactly. She mm. is. Okay, that's yeah. a good... No, I'm just thinking, how would you... Yes, it's a good, very good thing to bring to the person and say, do you know that you're literally... Culturally, you may be seen as a wife. Or even legally in some countries, you're probably seen as a wife, but in God's eyes, you're entering a situation yeah. of adultery. That's yeah. it. Exactly. And, yeah. And that's a good thing. And then how do you help somebody to kind of come to, because sometimes you just have to come to that. It's, it's a hard one. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, to sit here and, and pretend like it's not, because these are really real questions and they're very true questions. And I, you know, I don't want to. Be seen to minimize people's desires and their wants and their devotions um but there is something to be said mm -hmm. for attaching your purpose in life mm -hmm. your wants and your desires um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to phrase this as delicately as i possibly can in I have met and I've spoken to lots of women some of which were in the position where they desperately wanted a spouse some of them desperately wanting children and they were trusting God for, for such and such and, and, and some had children and lost them and others um, didn't have children but I would say maybe out of I, I mean I won't say I've spoken to hundreds but certainly a, a few women but a lot of them say to me, the point at which everything changes is when they surrender to God. When That's they it. surrender themselves completely mm -hmm. to God's purpose. And it's not their wants. It's not about what they want. It's not about, yes, they have desires. And, and doing that won't stop you wanting a husband. Doing that won't stop you wanting a child doing that won't stop you wanting that big ceo job or whatever your aspiration is or your ambition is but a lot of the people that women that i've spoken to and i can only speak for women because that's the most people i speak to say that the tipping point for them is when they realize that their purpose in life is defined and predestined by god not by what they want number one not by um how they choose to define themselves or what what definition they attached to themselves um as a result of you know societal or even personal pressures that we put ourselves under sometimes it's personal yeah, yeah. and i have spoken of the you know a couple of women spring to mind and i'm not going to call anybody's name but a couple of women spring to mind where they have um they've not been married they've not had any children and they've mm -hmm. really struggled with that for about 12 15 years um and a few months ago i spoke with one of them and she said to me she said the moment i accepted that that was not god's plan for me to have biological children in this life she said she felt set free her relationship with God completely changed. I mean, Giselle, you can relate to this, can't you? But what no. was that like for you? Because I know that, you know, personally, feel free to not share if you don't want to, mm -hmm. but I know it's a personal testimony um, for you. But how did you feel? Because you were trying for, for children as well for a very long time and you wanted children. And Big you time. would have been a great biological mother. But I know that you're a wonderful spiritual mother. And you certainly are to me. <laughs> That's the best type, I tell you. It is the best type, it really is. Yeah, I spent a fortune uh, mm. in time and money and mm. everything going. And in those days, going through IVF treatment, I, I lost two children. 
-hmm. and then went through IVF treatment. In those days from Northern Ireland, IVF treatment wasn't done there. So I had to travel to St. John's Wood in London to have the Mm -hmm. treatment done. And that was horrendous. It was staying at nice, nice enough hotel, but all the injections pumped into you and everything from mm. home. All I wanted was my own house, my own mm. bed, and I couldn't get to it. And um, went through it seven times, mm. implanted several times. Mm. It never worked. That was beginning to drive me absolutely bananas. Mm. And really, I didn't come to terms with that up until I became born again. Mm. And then I realized that God had a better plan for me. Mm. And okay, I know there's nothing but better God can plan for a woman than to have children. Mm. But at the same time, I have loads of spiritual children. Mm. And I am. Amen. I'm I one am, of them. Yes, you are indeed, <laughs> my dear. You really are. So I'm going to slap you. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and, and that is absolutely fantastic. So it is you. I've got some spiritual daughters over in Florida. Mm. Mm. I've got a spiritual daughter in Sri Lanka. Mm. Uh, you know, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. It, it, it really is. So, yes, once you realize, once you come into God's plan for you mm. and let it fall in shape, everything's mm. a lot better. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And I know another one of these ladies said to me, she said that for her, it was the minute when she realized that God's plan for her life was not attached to her being married. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. so important. That's really important. And I think for me, I think it's a two-step thing. Well, that's my own logical way to see it. Because mm. I think for a lot of people, like you said, Denise, sometimes I think the pressure is twofold, especially when it comes to children. Mm. For yeah. the African background. It can be social and it can be mm-hmm. from yourself, just feeling yeah. like I would have wanted to be a parent. And so sometimes we also know that society uses these things to define people and give value mm-hmm. to people. So mm-hmm. I think the minute you realize that, you know, right? Mm-hmm. So that's one step because you can think, okay, I don't see, I, I have a kind of slightly different story in the sense that I was never one of those people who was crazy about marriage. I was just like, okay, 50-50, if it happens, amazing. If it doesn't, well, no one's going to die because of this. But you know, you have that social aspect of it where you still know that people can eye you a certain way. Mm-hmm. There was a time when I really didn't like going to weddings because you don't want this all when it's a good night business. And mm-hmm. you know, there are so many things, even with your friends, you see how things change. You see how there is some kind of social hierarchy, right? Mm-hmm. And you see, even in, in the media, you have movies, it's always that high end, you find love, you get married. So everywhere tells you that, hey, this is it. So if you're not finding your, because you have to live in a society, those things will affect you. So you mm. get to the point where you just, you know, have that moment and you say, no, this doesn't define me. But then this is the beauty of being born again, because I think when you're not born again, you're very logical and you're like, yeah, this doesn't define me. I'll be defiant. I'll move on. I'll do my thing. Mm-hmm. And you make good people in your corner, like Sidonie. <laughs> if, you're not born again, if you're born again, that's good because you think, oh, this doesn't define me. So what does, right? Mm-hmm. And that's where the whole purpose of God comes through because mm-hmm. I was particularly elated when, you know, I became born again and I, like, God does not, ugh, like, this is just not the thing for God. Mm-hmm. I loved it because I think for me, I had kind of, how can I put it? I kind of never just liked the social, the way society defined marriage and the Mm -hmm. exaggerated status that it gave marriage. Um, I was always a fan of marriage, even before becoming one again, but I just did not like what an idol marriage had become. Mm -hmm. When I saw that, hey, like God doesn't see, I was like, whoa, come, like, I love you even more, you know? So for me, it was, you don't have to be married to be saved. You don't need children to be saved. And yes, God can really pair you up with somebody amazing. So if you're praying for marriage, please keep praying because there are also amazing things that God can do with people as a married couple. But yeah, that is not the thing to peg your relationship. In. Nothing. No. Nothing no. should really be the thing to, to peg your relationship with God on. Nothing. Mm. Nothing should really be 
God himself, right? Because I was mm-hmm. just thinking the other day, we have all these things from God that we love, right? We have our talents, we have our families. So you think if God gives you these things that you love so much, then what, what could God himself be like? Mm-hmm. Yes, love. Hey. Ste- Stephanie yeah. says, Oh, hello, God- Stephanie. Yeah, she, oh, she, she, she's on oh. Facebook. She wow. says, God deals with the saved differently than the unsaved. An unsaved goal is salvation. Saved goal, saved goal is faith increase and sustaining. Mm. That's so true. That's, yep. that's, so that's true. deep. That's deep. That's deep. That is. Right. Ladies, it is eleven minutes past ten. Thank you very much, um, my mm-hmm. timekeeper. Yep. Yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much thank you but no thank you stephanie for joining us and yes. you do you want to pray us out and yeah and, and the lovely messages that we've and experiences that we've shared today okay lord god almighty first and foremost we give you thanks for everything you've done for us and lord god almighty i give you thanks for these beautiful women with us tonight sidonia and Nahum. father god Nahum said that just a few months ago that anyone who's praying for a husband or a wife to continue praying Mm. because Lord God Almighty, we know that you have a great big plan for everybody. Mm. And Lord, we ask that those people that are praying for that spice, that you have something, someone wonderful ready for them. Mm. If their life is meant to be, Father God, to be lived by themselves, then Mm. give them that comfort. Wrap your your Holy Mm. Spirit around them. Give them that comfort. Let Mm. them know that they're not alone. Let them know that they can do everything through Christ and they don't need anyone beside them. Amen. Lord, I do give you thanks for all the children that you have given women. And I give Mm. you thanks, Father God, that we are a one man, one woman marriage institute Mm. Mm. and lord i just give you i i give you thanks for everyone that i know lord and give you thanks Mm. for the ability that we've been able to come back on tonight and have our zoom chat Mm. i ask you to bless everyone that's been listening and until we all meet again all god's people we can all say amen 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 Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank right. you, everybody. I will close Good night. Do- yeah, I will close down on Zoom first of all. Mm-hmm. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.